Our next guest is a musician, a producer, and an award-winning podcast host. Please welcome the famous, the infamous Rishikesh Hiraway to the South by Southwest studio, the legend. I've, I've heard you described by my crew as the podcast guru. <laughs> And they didn't even know you were South Asian. Right, So right. this was not... So a, yeah, yeah. it wasn't racist at not all. Not racisty at yeah. all. This was... A, and like, oh, he's South Asian. Ugh, the podcast king. Sure. Uh, and, and, but you're also a musician. People also don't realize you're a musician. Uh, you, you're a producer. You are now a cook during the pandemic. But to me, you are also a kid of Desi immigrants. And I want to take uh, the DeLorean back to the origin story. Okay. And I'm going to make an assumption. Correct me if I'm wrong. Most kids of Desi immigrant parents, we are not told, Beta, you can grow up and be a musician. Yeah. We get the Holy Trinity. Sure. Doctor, yep. engineer, dubious businessman who somehow makes money. Right. <laughs> right. right. So uh, is this assumption correct that your parents said, Beta, you go be a podcast host and be a musician? The only thing that was different is there was a, we, I had a different third leg for the Trinity, which was lawyer. Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I'm older than you, that's why. I right. <laughs> it's corporate lawyer, though. How are those loser lawyers, right? Well, my grandfather was a judge. Mm. So, you know, that, that shadow loomed pretty large. So that was also acceptable. Um, but, yeah, musician was not, not on the list. Not on the list. But when you were a young boy, it didn't stop you. You were still creating. Yeah. I mean, I think my parents thought, this is a nice hobby. This is a, you know, yeah. our child is having a well-rounded uh, upbringing. But then as I got older and I kept doing it and I kept on talking about it, then they started to get worried. You know, the sweat like, used to come down. Yeah, exactly. They're like, Ho hobby, <laughs> hobby, right? Minor. Yeah. Right. But, <laughs> exactly. but when do you know, oftentimes when I talk to, you know, a lot, lot of kids of immigrants, there's a reason why it was because our parents came here with little and they want security, right? It makes sense. But when I talk to many artists like you who make it, they say, yeah, even when I did the insurance, even when I got the degree, I always knew. <laughs> Back of my head, even though I didn't dream it, I always knew. When did you know? Um, for myself or when did for I yourself. know that my parents were no, 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 no. fine? No, 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 excuse me. For yourself, when did you know that even though I can't articulate this to my parents, my community, yeah. the world, this is what I want to do? I, I started playing in bands when I was in high school and, uh, and I, I loved it but I don't think that even I understood that it was something that I could do mm. as a living until, um, until after I graduated college. I knew it, was, it was basically what I majored in in college unofficially um, because I spent all my time playing music and playing shows. But after I graduated, um, I, went on, I went on a tour and I remember coming back from that tour and, and I had been in this mode of like, I'm gonna try and make music as much as I can in between whatever job I'm having. The insurance. Right, right. yeah. <laughs> to, ple to please the parents and the community. Yeah, and just because that's what I thought you did. Right. But then um, after that tour, uh, something flipped. I, I think I was 20, I was 21. Um, I was about to turn 22, and uh, so maybe this feels a little bit late, but at that moment I said, okay, no, I'm gonna invert this, and I'm gonna try and make music uh, as much, much as I can, and I'll do whatever job I have to in order to make that fit. So it, nothing actually changed in my life, but the priorities shifted in my mind. Well, and also, the, I mean, you're saying nothing changed your life, but I think there was a profound shift where what was always percolating, what was always there came to the forefront and you made the intention and to own it. Yeah. You're like, oh, I, could, I, I am this. I am a creator. Yeah. I can do this. And when you look back in life, though, it's oftentimes when you can connect the dots. And, and you had this very moving story in your TED Talk. Your mother uh, passed away recently. You were talking about, the, you know, thinking back, you're like, oh, even when I was a kid, my mom used to hum my tunes in the kitchen, right? And, 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 and how was that, like, later on in life, you're like, oh, shoot, that's an act of validation. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. in a way that she, she, like, even the fact that your mom's humming your tunes, to you as a young boy, were you able to appreciate the significance of that? Um, it made me happy. I don't think I realized what it really was until later. I, I, we had the conversation kind of after... I got to the point where I was like, oh, yeah, this is my job and everything's okay. And they got to the place where they were like, yeah, okay, everything is okay. And, and they explained, um, I think, really coherently for the first time at that point that they're like, you know, the reason why we were so worried about you being a musician was not because we didn't believe in you mm -hmm. or, or anything like that, but they were like, it's just so unknown. Not only is it a, a job that we aren't familiar with in terms of what you do, we don't know anybody who's ever done this. And especially anybody who looks like us with our names. Yes. Yeah. Who's made it, they say. Yeah. Yeah. Right? 
Yeah. And, and when you were growing up, and uh, we were growing up, we, we didn't have Desi podcast hosts. Right. We didn't have TV show hosts. All we had was Fareed Zakaria. Right. Right. <laughs> and, and we didn't even have Desi musicians. And so you have trailblazed in many ways. And so when you told uh, your friends, you're like, hey, I'm going to do a podcast. What do they say? Uh, what yeah. is a podcast? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who is podcast? <laughs> yeah. They, uh, I mean, because this was 2013. And yeah. so it was pre-serial pre the like podcast boom um, such as it was and so you know that when I first started I remember there were all these articles that came out um, saying how do you download a podcast you know right. here's how you subscribe it's to very something. recent people forget that this yeah is, yeah yeah so um, forget about my parents but even my peers didn't know <laughs> what <laughs> what that meant and you the podcast that really got you on the map right uh, is a podcast that's still going that has transformed into a Netflix series, has two seasons, is a Song Exploder, right? Yeah. And specifically what you do, it's really interesting is, for those who have not seen the show or heard the podcast, is it's like a forensic audit of a song. It's like this is how a song came to life. And, and you are able to ask the creator how, like the, about the journey, right? Yeah. And, and, and as you've talked to so many artists, and now you ever sit there and go, I can't believe... I'm sitting and talking to this artist. Tell me about the journey. Like, what's an artist where while you were sitting and interviewing them, you were having like a surreal out-of-body experience? I, I think it happens all the time. But I remember one, uh, one time when I was interviewing Bjork. That was a really, really big deal because she is one of my musical heroes. And the chance to talk to her was incredible. And also it was, it was a little strange because it was long distance. She was in London and I was at home. And so it was kind of easy to forget what was happening for a second, and then suddenly be like, I'm on the phone with Bjork. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever get that still to this day? Yes, absolutely. Like every episode, you're like, Nine Inch Nails, uh, Trent Reznor is explaining to me how I did this song. Yeah. This is happening. Yeah. And, and like, do you resort back to that kid? Is yeah. I mean, the next episode, the, the episode that's going to come out uh, next on the podcast is with the composer Steve Reich. And I'm just, I can't believe that that's a sentence that I'm saying right now. <laughs> you know, like, You're a sentient human being in reality saying yeah. the sentence, right? Yeah. And, and you get paid for this. <laughs> um, I guess so. I mean, I, I, I pay myself. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, sure. But, but, but yeah. you make a living doing this, right? Yeah. And, and the question I have is for, for people like you who have, and this is my compliment to you, a trained ear, how, what, is the, what is the way to truly listen to a song? Well, I think um, if you want to... If you want to do it right, you know, you have to tune everything else out, you know, turn everything else off. When you're mixing a song and you're trying to really, like, balance everything, they say, you know, turn off the monitor if you're looking at uh, Pro Tools or something like mm -hmm. that. Turn off the monitor, close your eyes, and, you know, you do a little bit of sensory deprivation. And if you take that principle further, I, I think uh, it's really important, too. So, you know, try it. If you're, if you're really trying to listen, do it at a time when that's the activity. Most of the time when we're listening to music, it's passive. But if you can be like, this is what I'm doing, as opposed to I'll do it while I'm doing the dishes or, or something Working like that. Working out. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it, it changes the experience. What is it about, you know, it could be poetry for some people. It's, it's cooking for others. What is it about music that is so powerful for you? What does it unlock? Well, I think it's the fact that you have both you both have the poetry of the words, but then also this um, very difficult to articulate emotional experience with the music. Mm. Um, the idea of just like a melody is so powerful and can just make you feel things that are uh, impossible to describe. Um, to be able to wrap that, you know, just the musical quality and also, you know, storytelling or whatever the lyrics are, um, it's sort of this multifaceted experience, and I think it, it just it touches people, it ties people to certain moments in their in their life, and I, I don't think there's anything like it. We were interviewing uh, the legendary Linda Perry uh, earlier, and she says that she holds on oftentimes to the pain from the past as an inspiration for the musical journey, right, for creativity. Mm -hmm. And she went deeper and talked about her parents and her family. Uh, what what is it? Uh, what emotion? do you seem to latch on to most when you're creating? I think, um, you know, one of the first pieces of music or, or sort of first things that I used to listen to when I was growing up was uh, my, my parents would play old, like, 60s Bollywood music. Classics. Same yeah. here in my family. Yeah. yeah. Um, and those songs uh, just made me feel nostalgia. And I don't think I understood what nostalgia was. You know, I was like five, six years old. What could I be nostalgic for? But there was something in the music 
where that, that feeling was like introduced to me. And also your parents, I'm sure your parents' response to that music. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, my, my, my parents didn't really have the vocabulary to talk about music, but just the, the way that they loved it. And the, my, the fact that my mom would sing along. And Again, she, all the, she knows, she all, knows the lyrics. all the words. In the kitchen. Yeah, yeah exactly. She's singing Rafi. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, that was, again, it was like, oh yeah, I know she loves this. But I think that feeling um, is something that I'm still trying to go for. Like, can you make music now that feels like it's nostalgic mm. for something and gives you that, that feeling of nostalgia is this, such a complicated feeling where you're happy and you're sad and you're full of memories all at the same time. Um, whatever that, there's probably a German word for all. <laughs> Germans always have words for these. Yeah. But there's a yearning, but there's a yearning and a memory that also brings a sense of joy and yes, comfort. Exactly. Nostalgia sometimes brings comfort. Yeah. So whatever that is, that that six layer sandwich, that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to get. Which you will probably find in Texas <laughs> <Right>. barbecue. <laughs> and, and it'll give you a heart attack. There is a great uh, quote attributed to Samin Nasrat, your brilliant uh, chef. Um, a host of the Netflix series, also co-host of the podcast that you all came up with, Home Cooking during the pandemic. She says this about you. One of his superpowers is that he's very good at knowing what will work hmm. and what won't. How did you develop the superpower? Um, I think uh, by being really critical. Something I learned from my parents. <laughs> being... hmm, what a surprise. <laughs> yeah. From, from Desi immigrant parents. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, being self-critical, yes. Uh, so I think, um, I mean, sometimes it backfires uh, for me, especially when it comes to music, but I think in other instances it can be helpful. I think, um, you know, th there's like a level of rigorous testing internally that I do for everything that... Um, uh, internally, you said? Yes. Uh, and explain so, that if you don't mind. Well, sometimes when I say these things that are going on in my head out loud, my friends are like, you're being too hard on yourself or whatever. Um, but I think it's actually part of you know, it's part of being a good editor. Um, being an editor is not just a matter of like chopping up a sentence or, or a paragraph or something like that. It's also sort of having some empathy for who the final viewer, who the final audience is. Um, I, I was a graphic designer in college, mm -hmm. and I think this is part of like the design um, philosophy too. It's like you have to imagine who's looking at this thing and how are they going to react to it. You have to kind of put yourself in the shoes of the audience in the moment of creation. And, um, At the same time, you have to wear both hats. Yeah, exactly. There's like an applied psychology that, that goes into it. And, um, and if you fall too in love with your own ideas, you might be blind to what somebody else could experience. And there's no way to, of course, count for everybody. But I think if you're at least considering that uh, really heavily, then, then the chances of falling into some kind of um, navel-gazing trap is you're you're a little safer who knows somebody might think about all the stuff that i make and be like well you failed <laughs> <laughs> you you're not a doctor you failed <laughs> right, exactly. uh, but you know there's a recurring theme uh, uh, we've interviewed more than 50 people this week and some people like you at the top of their game respected the creme de la creme gurus kings queens uh, linda perry is one of them uh, dulce sloan's another one the recurring theme is uh, if people hear the voice that we have in our own, our own head, we are our worst enemy. We kick ourselves. Hmm. In fact, our friends have said that if you were to say what you say about yourself to us, we'd punch you in the face. Yeah. And the, the response sometimes is we need that to keep our edge. Do you think there's a balance that you're developing? You're like, you know what? I, I can also let a little bit of that. I can let it, I can let it go a bit. I, I can let it go. I, I've, I've earned it. Yeah. I've earned a little bit of self-love also. Um. Maybe in theory, but in practice, in order to get there, I've actually uh, found I have, to, I have to actually turn to other people. Um, so I, I've been making music again, and in all Congratulations. Of this, oh, thanks. <laughs> no, seriously, the first time you said in 10 years? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's been a long time since I put out a record, and part of it is because um, that sort of critical voice in my own head uh, was killing everything mm. that I could ever come up with. Um, so this is where it kind of backfires. You know, when it came to music, I was just... I, I, couldn't write for a long time. But then um, I started writing with other people. Um, my friend Jenny Owen Young, who I'm on tour with, uh, invited me to write a song with her, and then um, and we were able to write a song, and it was incredible. And then I asked her if she would write a song with me for one, for one of my songs. And there was this little moment where I, you know, I, I played something, and I had an idea, and uh, I sang it and played it, and, um, 
And in my head, I was about to say like, oh, this is so stupid. And then she played it on her guitar and she sang it. I was like, oh, that, that sounds nice, actually. <laughs> yeah. Hey! Um, and I think just by virtue of it coming out of somebody else, mm. um, it let me think about it in a way that was different from something that was entirely internal. And, uh, and sometimes I have said, you know, oh, this is dumb. And she'd be like, just, just hold on, hold on. Like, don't give up on it yet. I think because, again, she was hearing an idea coming from somebody else. She could give it a little objectivity. Mm. And, um, and bit by bit, bit, we actually, like, you know, I got to finish songs. And, um, and that was something, it's basically been a new experience um, in, in my life, in this chapter of my life. And, and you, have, you had a podcast about partnerships. This was an example of a partnership that allows you to step outside your own head yeah. and, and, and give your creativity a validation and oxygen that you would have snuffed out. Yeah. Right? And I think it's important, and, and thanks for letting me stay on this for a bit, because there, there are creatives who watch the show. Right? There are people, South by Southwest discovers talent. And there's people who are like, ah, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. And they, once they hear the people who are crushing it with this type of self-doubt, in a way, maybe it could be like, oh, I'm not the only one. But also maybe it could be a cautionary tale that sometimes we're too self-critical. We, 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 we engage in a self-paralysis. Yeah. I mean, 10 years is a long time. Yeah. <laughs> to yeah. create albums, right? And do you feel like there was something about the pandemic then, about this moment that we're going through that gave you an opening to revisit creativity? Um, you know, it was something that I had been, I, I felt sort of separated, lost from music for, for many, many years. Um, and I was just itching to, to get back. And I think I was, I just needed a little bit of space mm. in my own schedule and in my own life to figure out how to do that. Um, it happened to all line up in the pandemic. And, and so I do think that it was part of it. It wasn't certainly like an idea that was born in the, in, in the pandemic, but I think the pandemic, uh, the circumstances of it, helped make it happen. And in this moment of pause and this moment of silence has allowed people to create. Uh, some people say they feel like they're languishing, but then it, it forces them a type of introspection, right? And, and you took this moment to create music. You've been producing, you've been commenting, you've been helping other people flourish. Talk to us about this album uh, that is they're gonna be your first album in 10 years. Yeah, um, it's called Rooms I Used to Call My Own. And, and half of the songs I wrote with Jenny and half the songs I wrote with my friend John Mark Nelson, um, who Jenny introduced me to. And then there's a bunch of people who uh, are on the album, other people who have collaborated with me. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma plays cello on it. Um, Jay Som sings on it. K um, Kimbra did vocal production and sings. These are up and coming vocals. talents that, yeah, one <laughs> day, inshallah, they might make it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> one day, yeah. Um, but, and these are all kind of ways that I, I was able to collaborate with people, and it really, it really changed the experience for me. Um, going from this thing that, in theory, I wanted to do to actually getting to do. And, and once you, once you sit down, and, and, and you hear the completed album, uh, it was like when I finished my book, but when I actually saw the book yeah. in the hardcover, yeah. uh, th there is for the creator, there's a moment, and once you actually s heard it, hearing your own work, how did it feel? Well, um, <laughs> you can cry. This is a safe yeah. space for tears. <laughs> so, you know, this record's only coming out digitally. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, like I still don't have the like you don't have the moment. The like no, the, I'm talking like figuratively. Moment. The but actual yes. once you once you said this is the album. Yeah, um, I think when it comes out and I can actually see it and see that people are listening to it, um, it'll be it'll be pretty wild. But even just like the first song that came out was was the one about my mom mm. um, that Yo Yo Ma played on, and I think yeah when that. When that came out, and I was like, "Here is a new song. Here's my first new song," and you know, in in ten years, um, it felt pretty emotional. But I think it was hard to separate, uh, you know, again the six layer sandwich of the emotions because because it was about my mom, because of because it was uh, a new step. Um, there were a lot of things happening. <laughs> I was overwhelmed by a lot of it. You know, if, if you don't mind me asking, oftentimes we're at this age right now uh, where we get hit with death and birth and waves. Yeah. Right. People are having kids, and then elders we thought would live forever are, are, are being buried. Yeah. And, and oftentimes, and I'm speaking for myself, we can't have a conversation with them. And we regret the conversation we didn't have. I find that if a musician in particular is very lucky that in a way through the song you can have a conversation maybe with your mother. And maybe I'm thinking too much into this, but do you feel like this song allowed you to connect with your mom? Yeah, I mean, it was literally born out of that feeling because 
uh, what happened was um, after I had come home from her funeral, uh, a couple of weeks later, I, I had a dream about her. And mm. in the dream, we had a conversation. Mm. And my mom had been ill for, for a pretty long time. And so we a couldn't actually have the kinds of conversations that we used to have when I was growing up. It had been a long time. Um, it had been many years since uh, I got to kind of interact with her in the way that I got to in the dream. I got to connect with not just my mom alive again, but, but sort of a memory of her, the version of her that I think of. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I woke up and then the next day I already had a songwriting session planned with, with Jenny. Mm. Um, and uh, so I remember I just, just sort of trying to hold on to the feeling of that dream until we started. And then, um, and, then, and then we got on, we were doing it over Zoom, we got on Zoom and I was just like, here's everything that's just happened and here's everything that I'm, that I'm thinking about and I wanna try and write about this. I wanna write about this actual conversation. So, so absolutely it feels like a conversation um, between the memory of my mom and, uh, and, and myself. Uh, I'm sure she'd be humming it <laughs> if she could. Uh, thank you for your time. I have 30 seconds left with you. Uh, uh, you're the guru. If there's one podcast that's up and coming and there's one musician at South by Southwest that people should be paying attention to, who should it be? Who has your stamp of approval? Okay, well, obviously Jenny has my stamp of approval. Of course. We're going on tour together and, and she's amazing and not enough people know about her. Um, Can you give her full name again? Jenny Owen Youngs. Yeah. Jen, uh, Jenny Owen Youngs, musician to watch, podcast. Um, I just recently uh, felt like I had to answer the question, like, what's my favorite podcast? Yeah. Um, which is, you know, there's so many. You don't have to choose one, yeah. but you're making me choose one. No, choose two or three. Go ahead. Uh, no, e everything is alive. Um, everything is alive. Is an incredible, incredible, like, joyful, funny, inventive podcast where the host, Ian Chillog, interviews inanimate objects. Um, and somehow it's like, I once saw a live taping of Everything is Alive, um, and it made me cry. And, and then I, every now and then I think about it. It was Ian sitting alone on stage with a chainsaw that had a microphone in front of it. Um, it's, it's a magical. And show. finally, you are allowed to promote yourself shamelessly. Look in the camera. Tell people when your album is coming out and where they can see you at South By. OK. Um, Rooms, I call, uh, Rooms I Used to Call My Own comes out on March 30th. I'm playing tonight at St. David's Bethel Hall at 10 p.m. It wasn't that bad. You did a good job. It was good. That was a nice flex. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us, Richard Thank Cash. you. Congratulations on the album. You can, again, see him tonight, March 15th, at 10 p.m. at St. David's Bethel Hall. And don't forget, you can watch all of our interview interviews on the South by Southwest TV app, available on Apple TV, Roku, Android TV, and Amazon Fire. These interviews are also available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash sxsw. And for a complete list of our interview schedule, check out sxsw.com slash studio. I'm Ajat Ali, and thanks for tuning in.